Thank you so much, uh, White Jeff. Uh, okay. So yeah, uh, I think the and uh, my my colleague has done a great job in terms of uh, sort of setting uh, the landscape around what we've been doing, and also White Jeff explaining uh, the CAPSI objective or aspiration. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the objective is actually to make sure that we cover all the 54 countries of Africa, trying to understand uh, the habits of high net worth individuals, especially as, as, uh, as their giving is concerned. So I, don't, I will not belabor the points around uh, the background to the studies, et cetera. The methods are roughly the same. Uh, there was the desktop study, then also focused by, uh, followed by interviews. Uh, some of us used a questionnaire interview. I think what is important as a preamble maybe is to explain the fact that uh, we are all searching for the ways of taking the continent forward. And the question that has been posed by others before is could Africa, could Af Africa's high net worth individuals be the catalyst for that kind of change, uh, given some of the investments that they've already made. There's a huge background to a high net worth, high level high net worth giving across the continent. Perhaps the most important one being the response to the Ebola outbreak uh, in uh, Sierra Leone and Sierra Leone in the Sierra Leone region and a bit of Liberia, uh, when uh, the then commissioner for the African Union, Kosazana Zamini Zuma, mobilized African high net worth individuals uh, and they to mobilize resources uh, as an African response to that. Prior to that, we had seen Africans also trying to respond in solidarity with the people of Haiti. So I think there's something that is going on. And I think that's what we've been trying to deal with. And this phenomena is now close to two decades or more in terms of us seeing what high net worth individuals are doing, their emergence and their growth. So in my paper, I talk about 23 billionaires that live in Africa, each with assets of 1 billion and above, more than 140,000 plus multimillionaires that earn at least 150,000 annually and they have assets, investable assets that are more than uh, that are more than uh, one million dollars. So we're trying to study this so that we, for us, the most important thing is trying to understand the the their behaviors in terms of just uh, okay, they earn money, but we're also trying to say how do they give, who do they give to, what prompts them to give, etc. So the countries that I was assigned to study. Uh, one of the things that we have to agree on first is uh, despite the interest and despite the excitement around high net worth individuals, the literature remains very sparse. The literature is very limited uh, in terms of high net worth giving across the continent. So, but what we know is uh, donors give mainly within their own countries. Uh, the majority of donations go towards social services and welfare relief. The majority of the large gifts are directed to the public sector and their own operating foundations. They prefer to give anonymously. And uh, in many instances, their religious values play a huge role in uh, determining the causes that they support. Also, there's been very limited funding coming out of high net worth individuals directed at NGOs. So this is just to give you a background. I'm not going to specifically spend time around the rationale, but for us, to, we're looking at sources of funding Africa's transformation. And the argument that others, including myself and others, is to say perhaps the African high net worth individuals through their giving and investments could be a catalytic agent and they could enhance domestic resource mobilization across the continent. So many countries, Rwanda is one of the leading countries in terms of just thinking around how do they harness the philanthropy of high net worth individuals and also other horizontal forms of giving, so there's a law there, there's a policy. The African Union embraced this and went a step further, established its own foundation, et cetera. So I think there's that sort of ex uh, excitement, but sadly that excitement has not been has not been driven or influenced by sort of a, a, a deep study into how high net worth individuals actually give. So this is a snapshot of high net worth uh, give uh, found foundations, high net worth owned foundations in the countries under study. So you'll see there's a lot of uh, South Africa and very little of say Mauritius. I'll show you, I, I have a case study of Mauritius that I'll show you later. Uh, but I think 
Now to explain these three countries, the similarities and differences, I think South Africa and Mauritius uh, share similarities in the sense that they have one of the most, they have maybe probably the most advanced financial markets. Uh, their financial services sector are highly sophisticated, but also highly regu regulated in a certain way that there's there are ways of predicting financial behaviors. But also in those, in that form of regulation, there's also a framework uh, that acts as an incentive for giving. So uh, there's uh, the tax deductible status that is given to nonprofit organizations in South Africa and Mauritius, which could also be part of the incentives uh, of Hawaii high net worth individuals in those two countries actually contribute to sort of to give towards NGOs and other entities that have got uh, the tax deductible status. So like I said, research methods mostly uh, the same as what uh, my colleague presented earlier. So let's just talk about demographics. Uh, we agree. We also found uh, very few high net worth individuals who are females who responded to our questionnaire. Uh, the age range is also interesting. The majority of uh, high net worth individuals that responded or that we spoke or we spoke to through their proxies in their foundations are in the age, age range of 41 to 55 and also 61 to 65. So yeah, we are, we are, we're yet to see uh, younger philanthropists who are yet high net worth individuals, perhaps explaining the time it takes for one to become a high net worth individual in these countries under study. But Zimbabwe and also the cases we're beginning to get about uh, gold trade, et cetera, may challenge some of these findings because we're actually seeing that there could be younger millionaires than are previously assumed. So it's exactly also highly educated people. Uh, they are either they have professional qualifications or master's degrees. We do not come up, we do not come across those with end PhDs, uh, we did not uh, recognize honorary PhDs. Uh, so this is, I think for us, this, this was like one of the begin the, the most of one of the things that we're trying to look at it to understand, to say, okay, we're talking about high net worth giving across Africa, but our interest is more ar around where are they getting the resources? What is the source of income? for them to be not only high net worth individuals, but also high net worth philanthropists. So you can see the drive here around tourism and leisure and also financial services. And given the context that I've already explained, you know the role of tourism in Mauritius and the role of financial services in South Africa explains that telecoms and, tele and technology, you see also as a growing sector, then we see here agriculture and mining. So in many instances, uh, the high net worth individuals under study, they run diversified conglomerates. So they are not single sector billionaires or millionaires, but they are diversified across these sectors that we are looking at. Uh, I hope that makes sense. So their net worth, when we're looking at high net worth individuals, um, I think the majority are in the uh, 500,000 to 1 million and, and also the, those with a million to 10 million. So this, this is the 66%. So from 500,000 all the way to 10 million, you've got 66%. And the remainder are distributed around those who have got above 10 million, they are only 11%. Those who've got uh, above 500, uh, all the way to 100 million, then we don't have any in the category of 100 million to 500 million. Then they move on, you get a new layer. These are now the ultra high net worth. Uh, was the classification I could see in the charts people fascinated with the classifications. There's a classification by AfriAsia. I think there's also a classification done by NetBank. All these wealth studies, they classify what they mean by how high net worth individual. Uh, entry level high net worth individual are those who earn at least $150,000 per year, but also have investable assets of at least a million dollars. Then what we call ultra high net worth individuals are those with at least half a billion all the way to a billion and above. So in, our, in this study, 22% would fit into what we call the ultra high net worth individuals. Yeah. So also we're interested in finding out, even though we're studying high net worth individuals who are domiciled or whose corporate interests are domiciled in what you may just call Southern Africa, including Mauritius in that region, 
we find that yes, they have business interests, all of them have business interests in Southern Africa, but some have expanded into West Africa and some have expanded into East and Central Africa. So then you ask of the high net worth individuals that we spoke to, how many of them have foundations? 75% have established a foundation and 25% uh, either give through their corporate company, through the tool of uh, corporate social responsibility or just informally. But you can see that fascination we're talking about at the beginning, that we see it again when we're just looking at how they, they are organizing them, they are giving. So most of them have formalized it into foundations. It's at times with separate boards from what exists in the corporate uh, company. Um, most of them have registered as trusts. Uh, very few have registered as foundations, and some have registered as charitable organizations. There is this formation called Company Limited by Guarantee, very popular in East Africa. It exists here in Southern Africa, but you can see none of them are registered that way. The majority prefer to register trust because trusts are easy. You can just register trust through a lawyer or you can actually then go to the deeds office and get a deed of trust. But in many instances, it's just through your lawyer putting together a trust and that is normally legally recognized even by uh, banks and other institutions and governments. Presence of board for the foundation. This was another thing to say. So these foundations that these high net worth individuals that, uh, that they are establishing, how are they run? Are they mom and pop institutions? You know, the founder maybe with his family, but we actually found that across the board, most of them have got board and they've got boards of governance. Uh, some have got CEOs as well, et cetera. But these boards are the ones that sort of help direct the vision and the mission of the foundation itself showing us the level of growth or maturity in thinking through how to structure uh, philanthropy amongst the high net worth individuals. Frequency of giving. Uh, this is very interesting because it explains again it, so another phenomenon. For those who've been studying foundations in the global north, you know that most of them have, got, have been endowed uh, with a sort of maybe a large gift from the beginning. You see this with uh, say the Ford Foundation, Rockefeller, even foundations that whose founders are still alive, they go through an endowment. But here, what you are beginning to see, if you look at this, these ones, that they are funding their uh, foundations on a monthly basis, because we didn't find anyone, any that had actually uh, an endowment in this region. So they use their corporates to allocate resources for monthly activities of their foundations. That's the majority, 63%. Then there are others who do annually, they'll set out an annual budget and they'll ask the team at the foundation to say, how much money would you need for this year? Then they'll be given that budget at the beginning of the year. Then the others will give, and these are more the religiously inclined, uh, there are high levels of giving around certain calendar times, Christmas, Diwali, Ramadan, et cetera. So again, showing the relationship between religious values and the giving that happens because for Christians, they may be prompted to give at a certain season. And also the same follows for those uh, in those who are Muslims may also feel like part of the Muslim of the Ramadan fast is actually about giving away wealth. So you find that there are high levels of giving during that time. So religion playing an important role in terms of triggers of uh, giving, what triggers these high net worth individuals to give. Sizes of gifts. Uh, the majority of the gifts are between 5,000 and 10,000. These are the recorded gifts. So when we're looking at this, we're not looking at gifts to their foundation. We're looking mostly at gifts to outside entities. Yeah. So where you see that others have given about 500,000. Uh, one of the most, one of the biggest recorded gifts in our sample, or two of them. The first one was uh, done by a Zimbabwean couple, Titi and Strife. They gave 10 million towards the Alliance for the Green Revolution in Africa when Strive was uh, in the incoming board chair. Significant gift of 10 million in, at, at once. Then there have been other gifts that have been given, the Motepes and others giving those big gifts. But you see that the majority of the gifts are actually in the 5,000 to 10,000 range. And these are normally maybe to local grassroots NGOs. We see this in, in uh, Mauritius and also in South Africa. Uh, the most active philanthropy organization in Zimbabwe in terms of giving to organizations is again the organization that is led by Titi and Strife, also engaged in giving at that level. 
but mostly in small, small grants to organizations that are working at the grassroots levels. So geographic reach of philanthropy activities, uh, we're trying to understand because many of them, if you remember, I showed you a chart where we showed that most of their uh, entrepreneurial, enter, entrepreneurial ventures have extended beyond the countries where they are domiciled. So for instance, if you look at City and Strive's uh, empire, it's now cutting across. They are the majority owners of liquid telecoms. So you're going to find them in Kenya, et cetera, et cetera. So we wanted to find out because there's an assertion that we had made at the beginning, which was a hypothesis to say, high net worth individuals are Pan-African in terms of their business, but they are villagers or they focus more of, on their countries in terms of their giving. So we're looking at all the high net worth individuals to say, do they spread or do they follow their uh, corporate footprint in terms of their giving? So we noticed that the majority of them give in the entire country, then at only 33%, only some selected cities, and some only 33% actually say we do both within the country and outside country of residence. Yeah. So you already begin to see that is coming up to say uh, revenues end across Africa may end up being concentrated, for instance, in a one in one region like say South Africa, and the giving is only limited to that, while these resources are being earned elsewhere. Speaking again to the challenge, the political economy of philanthropy itself and the extraction model, which is not the subject of this discussion today. So beneficiaries, who are the beneficiaries of this, uh, these philanthropic uh, gifts? Uh, they mostly start off with the extended families. Then they look at uh, ventures to do with children, with orphans. And also they're very active in trying to raise the next generation of entrepreneurs. Then they are also focus, uh, they also focus on youth and NGOs. And there is an interesting issue, zero percent for women. My co-presenter, my, my, my colleague who presented earlier spoke about the absence of philanthropy, of philanthropy, of, of the absence of women amongst high net worth individuals. But here we're actually seeing the absence of women in the radar of high net worth individuals when it comes to their giving. We could have missed something because there have been some gifts that have been done in South Africa, but in terms of the actual amounts, maybe it is the amounts that sort of make it then very difficult to detect. There's room for error, for, there's a margin of error, but in the majority of cases, there are very few women organizations that may testify that they receive their funding from high net worth, African high net worth individuals. Do these organizations measure their effectiveness? Yes, most of them do. Uh, are they affected by changes in the macroeconomy? You know, the different uh, cycles of uh, economic activity, uh, shrinking and growth of macroeconomy. Yes, 67% say they are affected and it also affects their own giving patterns. Uh, in Zimbabwe, for instance, most of those who are high net worth individuals here and they have corporate presence here, they are affected by currency fluctuations. So for instance, there was a year when we said Strive Masiwa risks losing his billionaire status, not because he has done anything wrong, but because the currency had tanked and his, ma his major entrepreneurial activities are concentrated in a country like Zimbabwe. So when it comes to valuation that is done by Forbes, it may actually begin to evaluate, evaluate his asset best and the net worth of his companies and begin to say he's outside of the, uh, that club of billionaires in Africa best just on those changes. The same applies to South Africa. Uh, the challenges that the South African RAND is facing, et cetera, also affects uh, levels of giving. Collaboration with other African philanthropies, it's not where it should be, but it's beginning to happen. We see them collaborating through the African Philanthropy Forum and also through other ventures. What we've actually seen, and this is very interesting, is the role of outsiders who come and help to mobilize African philanthropies to work together. But I think it was more apparent during the COVID-19 pandemic that high net worth individuals began to work together. Uh, in South Africa, it was through the Solidarity Fund. In Zimbabwe, it was through the Solidarity Trust. All these were platforms that were established to help mobilize and coordinate the giving by high net worth individuals. Areas of collaboration, we list those. So brief analysis of wealthy Mauritians, uh, individuals and families. So you see that when you look at the source of wealth, 
across the board. It's highly diversified. Yeah, it covers sugar, telecoms, poultry, so that's agro-industry, et cetera, and textile and hotels, that's tourism, et cetera. And if you look at the, Mauritius is interesting in the sense that it's potentially the richest country and also the country that is closer to a fair distribution of wealth because whereby in, the, in, uh, in other countries, African countries, the average per capita distribution of wealth is close to $2,000 per family or less. In Mauritius, it's close to 30,000. So telling you that uh, these are people with sort of some level of uh, comfort, poverty is, is at its lowest in Mauritius. Families that live under a dollar a day are less than 1% compared to other countries. And these are the kinds of sort of the, sort of a case study of the different high net worth uh, families or individuals and what they are doing. And in Mauritius, there is a law that 1% of declared corporate uh, profit goes is, is taken and it goes into a fund as collected by government, goes into a fund that, it, that is used to support NGOs. So in many instances, when you ask them, they, they refer you to that fund to say, we are already contributing 1% of our profits towards that fund. Then, gov then that agency is responsible for the distribution of those funds to different uh, NGOs spread across Mauritius. Uh, Zimbabwe and high net worth individuals, I think given what we've just been learning in the past uh, three weeks or so, uh, this chart could be redone, but this is what we found through literature review and also talking to different uh, sort of uh, carrying out interviews. Uh, and we can look at what they give towards. There's a heavy emphasis on, on the social sector, education, health, girls empowerment, leadership and lifelong development that sits and strive. Um, then uh, others are into sports, others just call their giving to a charity. Some of it is impromptu, it responds to a situation, may respond to a cholera outbreak, may respond to a national team, let's say the national netball team, which is stuck in Zimbabwe, but just to go and perform a play at a tournament in the UK. Before you know it, a funeral services company owned by a couple or high net worth individual intervenes, provides all the support. So at times, high net worth giving is highly ad hoc and responsive to emerging situations. So what are the emerging lessons? Um, I think the, for me, one of the most important points is to say, uh, I think there was a question that was raised, do they know about philanthropy? I think the question is to me is the extent they are connected to the, to the uh, to the field of practice of philanthropy, that's one, but also the broader field of development. To what extent is high net worth philanthropy being influenced by the studies that are coming from development organizations, by other NGOs, even by governments, that research? Because it looks like high net worth individuals, when they give, they give best on their things that are dear to them, things that they value, things that they like. They are not really sort of influenced by saying, let's do an assessment, a needs assessment. Well, it's beginning to emerge now and again, you begin to see that. So that's one. But also at the moment, it's uh, like I said, it tends to be ad hoc than strategic. So you cannot, you are not, for, you're not certain. Like I, I demonstrated that some of them, they get their funding on a monthly basis, the foundations that they run. So it's difficult to come up with a three-year strategic plan to say these foundations will take on this kind of work and do it to the full because they are also affected by the convulsions in the economy, et cetera. So these are interesting developments. They are nascent, but in the absence of endowed foundations where they still have to rely on the performance of the co parent corporate company, they're still like they face the risk of unsustainability or cutting short ventures that they've been uh, a part of. And also there are limited platforms for creating a community of practice among foundations established by high net worth individuals. So even though I made reference to the African Philanthropy Forum, when you go there, you will not see the individuals I've been making reference to. You may see one or two, but it's mostly their staff, et cetera, et cetera. So the, we, we appreciate they are busy, but we do not see, maybe it happens behind the scenes, the kind of collaboration, the kind of networking and learning from each other. It's not demonstrated at the moment. Thank you very much. I'll end here.